Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm Dustin Sebo, a professor at Michigan State University, and I'm director of the LaFrac Forum and the Symposium on Science, Reason, and Modern D Democracy. Um, I want to start by uh, saying some thank yous. Uh, first of all, uh, Zachary Bennett, the, the LaFrac Forum's uh, assistant director, um, was there from the beginning of this conference when it was only a conference in speech, and he single-handedly, or almost single-handedly, made it a conference indeed. Um, so thanks to Zach. Um, I also want to thank Rachel Mackey, who did much the same thing. Um, without her, this certainly wouldn't have happened. Um, she really went above and beyond. And thanks also to uh, the Hudson Institute more generally uh, for playing host to us. I don't know how many conferences on Nietzsche you have a year, but we're very <laughs> flattered and honored to be one of them. Um, so I'm just going to start by saying a few words about the theme of this conference and then introducing our speaker tonight. Every philosophy that places peace higher than war, every ethic with a negative version of the concept of happiness, every metaphysics and physics that knows a finale, a final state of any kind, every predominantly aesthetic or religious longing for an apart, beyond, outside, above, permits the question whether it was not illness that inspired the philosopher. I think this brief remark from the late preface to the gay science is more revealing of Nietzsche's stance than perhaps any other. Hobbes sought peace, but Nietzsche preferred war to peace because war is the locus of courage, and courage is the virtue through which nobility shines most brightly. Hobbes abandoned a summum bonum for a summum malum, but Nietzsche preferred a positive conception of happiness to a negative one, because as anyone who's read Hobbes knows, a happiness shot through with evils or fears by which it's determined isn't a happiness worthy of the name. So on the one hand, Nietzsche wanted a return. He wanted to return from, pre -modern, or from modern politics I'm sorry, which made society out to be nothing but a safe space for fearful men to pre-modern politics, which engaged far-reaching, deep-seated human longings for the noble and the good. At the same time, however, Nietzsche wanted to progress. He wanted to progress from the philosophical dogmatism and the otherworldly religious beliefs on which pre-modern politics was grounded to modern philosophy, which was both skeptical and this-worldly. In a way, then, Nietzsche wanted progress and return all at once. He wanted to restore the depth and height of pre-modern life on the basis of a modification of modern thought. And his efforts didn't go unnoticed. Zarathustra says at one point, thoughts that come on dove's feet guide the world. And for better or for worse, ever since the turn of the 19th century, Nietzsche's thoughts have indeed guided the world. On the right, the calamity caused partly by the popularization of his practical reflections in the first half of the 20th century is obvious. Too obvious, I think, to mention. Only slightly less obvious is the fact that under Nietzsche's influence, elements of the right have periodically come to despise the ways in which egalitarian liberalism seems to pull the rug out from under the nobility and beauty without which life seems not worth living. Their disgust with the present goes hand in hand with hopes for the future. But unable, typically, to do more than hope vaguely and idly for the coming of the historical conditions of a life worth living sometime in the future, they themselves prove woefully unable to live lives worth living in the present. In effect, their romantic longings for a social world in which nobility is more plausible takes the place previously occupied not only by doing noble deeds, but also, and perhaps more importantly, by thinking about them. Nietzsche's influence on the left is much less obvious than his influence on the right. But while less obvious, I think it's no less significant. Over time, under the influence of Nietzsche's theoretical teaching, the faith that the positive sciences are possible without metaphysics has given way to the realization that metaphysics, on which the positive sciences do in fact depend, is itself dependent on values, posited and yet cherished by cells with idiosyncratic or idiosyncratically ranked needs. The worlds in which we live would now seem to be creations of our peculiar lived experiences, if not of our peculiar wills. The slow but steady retreat of the social sciences and the humanities into the personal worlds of personally preferred individuals or individual groups 
was no doubt decisively prepared by the popularization of Nietzsche's theoretical reflections. More than that, though, the left has shown itself to be increasingly willing to view egalitarian liberalism as a value, to use Nietzsche's word, a value grounded not so much on the reason of those who cherish it as on their will, which comes to mean in practice on their power to enforce their will. And as the ground slowly shifted beneath egalitarian liberalism's feet, egalitarian liberalism itself underwent a transformation too. For example, in the ivory tower, precisely those who did their best to ignore Nietzsche's influence suffered the natural punishment for their philosophical sins. Unwittingly, they succumbed to his influence. It turns out when you throw thoughts to which you have no response out with a hay fork, they have a way of coming back. Nobody would ever accuse John Rawls, for example, of being too Nietzschean. And yet he did say in a theory of justice that our differences are profound and no one knows how to reconcile them by reason. And he said later on that while it's often thought that the task of philosophy is to uncover a form of argument that will always prove convincing against all other arguments, there is no such argument. Peoples may often have final ends that require them to oppose one another without compromise. And if these ends are fundamental enough, an impasse may arise between them and war comes. The ultimate conclusion of this line of thought was only drawn by Rawls in passing, in a well-known footnote, or a notorious footnote, I should say, where he said that we have the practical task of containing anti-democratic doctrines like we do war and disease. Rawls was left to hope, in other words, for the extermination of anti-democratic doctrines against which he had no convincing argument. Doctrines, however, live only in people. If we're being serious, if we're going to avoid the fate of Rawls on the one hand and of the idle hopers on the other, it's really only Nietzsche's influence on serious people, on people who, owing to their serious, remain somehow aloof from the petty politics of the left and the right that deserves to be taken very seriously. And for them, Nietzsche appears to offer a way, a, a rational way, to live nobly as well as happily in a world left reeling by the disappearance or death of God. Unable to bring themselves to believe in the philosophical dogmatism or the otherworldly religions on which pre-modern politics was based, unable at the same time to bring themselves to believe in the lies the last man tells himself about himself, they look to Nietzsche in the hope that he will be able to steer them or their thought clear of the charybdis of modern life and the scylla of pre-modern thought. Michael Granke, uh, Mr. Granke, as he's known at St. John's, is a serious person. A graduate of the University of Chicago and then Boston College, and now a tutor at St. John's College in Santa Fe, his lectures and papers on Nietzsche, Kant, Heidegger, Xenophon, Euclid's optics, and Lord Dunsany are legendary among those of us fortunate enough to have read or heard them. But as Nietzsche will tell you, writing doesn't amount to a hill of beans in comparison with thinking. And the fact that Mr. Granke is surely one of the world's very few truly great teachers bears witness to his power to think deeply and precisely about matters of the utmost importance better than any piece of writing ever could. I can say this with confidence because Mr. Granke was my teacher and not just mine. Over the years, he's produced a steady stream of truly outstanding students, myself excluded. I remember like it was yesterday, the first words he ever said to me. I don't know if he remembers. I was in my junior year at St. John's. As it happens, I'd been reading Nietzsche religiously for years, and I'd been so deeply moved by Nietzsche that I allowed myself to believe that I understood him. But then on the first day of a seminar devoted to Twilight of the Idols, Mr. Granke opened with a question. What's an idol? I wasn't just stumped, I was shattered. What's an idol? What exactly is an idol? I'd been reading Twilight of the Idols cover to cover since I was 13, and I didn't even know its title, except verbally. Mr. Granke let the Klaus flounder for a while before pointing out that Nietzsche himself tells us, idol is his word for ideal. I tried to cope. I tried to persuade myself that it was just a small oversight on my part. But then Mr. Granke asked another question. What's an ideal? And my stammering, rambling answer taught me and everyone else present that I didn't know. 
One of the many valuable lessons that Mr. Granke taught me over the years was this. There's a lot of daylight between a full heart on the one hand and clear eyes on the other. Or in Nietzsche's formula, tethered heart, free mind. And that means, I think, in the context of Nietzsche's thought, this. The pull of his practical thinking on our heartstrings must be limited and formed by the desire to know what Nietzsche himself desired to know. That is, its philosophic, theoretical grounds. To this day, I don't know anyone who brings so much intellectual honesty and ability to bear on so much deep appreciation for Friedrich Nietzsche than Michael Granke. Well, I want to thank uh, the Hudson Institute for having me back. I've, they've offered me the occasion to give a couple of talks previously about Nietzsche. This is just one more proof, I think, that it's Nietzsche's world. And I want to thank the Lefrac Forum for having me back. Uh, last year on the conference on religion's uh, refusal to die, I remarked that it was somewhat strange to have me included in that conference. Uh, it occurred to me then that it was strange to think that religion was having problems and that you should call a Nietzschean to help. <laughs> I hope this year's conference doesn't mean that Nietzsche's having problems. <laughs> I'm just going to talk about something fundamental to the thought of, of Friedrich Nietzsche, and I hope I open up a few thoughts for you that you maybe haven't thought about before. I'm going to ask some questions. <laughs> and we'll see what you think. So the title of my talk is entitled Letting Out, which is a pretty literal translation of German word, Auslassen, which is the actual word, I think, that Nietzsche uses to describe the will to power. So in Beyond Good and Evil, section 36, Nietzsche proposes that we might understand, at least experimentally, the whole world as will to power. This proposal begins with our inner world of desires, passions, drives, affects, and instincts. Nietzsche mentions all of these in this passage. All these things belong to life, and for beings like ourselves are ways in which we experience our living. These experiences are a basis for understanding life living itself, and Nietzsche proposes that we make the experiment to try to extend our understanding of the living to encompass the non-living as well. I'll read a long quotation. Suppose nothing else were given as real except our world of desires and passions, and we could not get down or up to any other reality besides the reality of our drives, for thinking is merely a relation of these drives to each other. Is it not permitted to make the experiment and to ask the question whether this given would not be sufficient for also understanding on the basis of this kind of thing, the so-called mechanistic or material world. I mean, not as a deception, a mere appearance, an idea in the sense of Barclay and Schopenhauer, but as holding the same rank of reality as our affect, as a more primitive form of the world of affects in which everything still lies in a powerful unity before it undergoes ramification and developments in the organic process, as a kind of instinctive life in which all organic functions are still synthetically intertwined, along with self-regulation, assimilation, nourishment, excretion, and metabolism as a preform of life. This attempt to understand everything in the same terms by which we understand our inner experience of life, amounts to understanding everything in terms of will. Quote, in short, one has to risk the hypothesis whether will does not affect will wherever effects are recognized, and whether all mechanical occurrences are not, insofar as a force is active in them, will force, effects of will. Now, this experiment is not just something we might try out. It is demanded by conscience and morality. The morality of method requires that we push the experiment of accounting for everything by this one cause 
until it reaches what Nietzsche calls the point of nonsense, Unsinn. When does this experiment become nonsense? It is apparently not nonsense to Nietzsche to suggest that our inner world, the world of mind, be understood on the same basis as the mechanistic or material world. So mind-body dualism goes away then. Again, it is apparently not nonsense to understand the living and the non-living on the same basis as differing only in degree. With these challenges surmounted, what remains to challenge this universal understanding of everything is will? Perhaps revelation, but perhaps not. And you might see Nietzsche's treatment of the saint in Beyond Good and Evil, especially in section 51, but the whole third main part. If the things in the world differ only in degree, does this not remove the basis of miracles, that is, differences in kind? Now, section 36 concludes with a specification. The world is not just to be understood in terms of the will, but in terms of one basic form of the will. Quote, suppose finally we succeeded in explaining our entire instinctive life as the development and ramification of one basic form of the will, namely of the will to power, as my proposition has it. Suppose all organic functions could be traced back to this will to power and one could also find in it the solution of the problems of procreation and nourishment. It is one problem. Then one would have gained the right to determine all efficient force univocally as will to power. The world viewed from the inside, the world defined and determined according to its intelligible character, it would be will to power and nothing else. This monistic account of the world is presented as hypothetical throughout. It is prefaced by supposes, it is called an experiment, it is called my proposition. It is merely the carrying out of the principle of method. But at the end, it is also the world viewed from the inside. Is the attention that Nietzsche continues to pay to the will to power, especially in Beyond Good and Evil, Merely an exploration reaching out to those limits that would render the understanding nonsense? Or is it a development of a way of viewing things that merits attention due to its own superior merits? To understand either the limits or the merits of the will to power as the basis of understanding the world, we need to understand better what this basic form of the will is. Here, nothing is so direct or so helpful as section 13 of Beyond Good and Evil. Quote, physiologists should think before putting down the instinct of self-preservation as the cardinal instinct of an organic being. A living thing seeks above all to let out, auslassen, its strength. Life itself is will to power. Self-preservation is only one of the indirect and most frequent results. Here Nietzsche is not describing specifically human life. He's describing the life urge itself in its most primitive form. Life is letting out. It is not a seeking of some external state or goal. Rather, what is sought is expression, letting out of strength. Now, at the end of section 13, Nietzsche adds this, quote, in short, here as everywhere else, let us beware of superfluous teleological principles, one of which is the instinct of self-preservation. Again, at this end, Nietzsche invokes the demand of method. What does he suggest here? Is will to power itself a teleological principle? What kind of telos is the outside? Or what kind of telos is letting out? To the primitive will to power, it does not seem to matter how its strength gets outside, nor is its letting out aimed at any specific effect or outcome. 
Another challenge to our understanding of the term will to power may come from the very form of that term. Will to power suggests to many that power is the object of the will. The will is a faculty of seeking, and power is an object that can be acquired, perhaps even stored up. Nietzsche may have meant to engage rhetorically in a tradition that proposes or proposed various wills toward various objects. For example, will to life or will to truth, things that he takes up in Beyond Good and Evil. However, such rhetorical engagement comes at the cost of some likely misunderstandings. As Nietzsche conceives of these matters, it is probably more correct to say that there is no will understood as a faculty of willing. And it is probably also more correct to say there is no power understood as something that can be accumulated and as something that is separable from effects. Now in Beyond Good and Evil section 19, Nietzsche says this, quote, willing seems to me to be above all something complicated, something that is a unit only as a word. What is collected under the unitary word will is a whole host of sensations combined with a ruling thought, combined with the affect of command. The will is not a faculty here, not a cause with its own characteristic effect. As Nietzsche says in Twilight of the Idols, quote, at the beginning stands the great fateful error that the will is something which produces an effect, that will is a faculty. Today, we know it is merely a word. And in Daybreak, Nietzsche even goes so far as to entertain the thought that, quote, perhaps there exists neither will nor purpose, and we have only imagined them. There's also a characteristic misunderstanding that attends the concept of power. Nietzsche sketches an interpretation of nature in Beyond Good and Evil, section 22, that would, quote, picture the unexceptional and unconditional aspects of all will to power. Such an interpretation of nature presents a scheme of natural necessity where, quote, every power draws its ultimate consequences at every moment. This understanding of power is one where at all times, every capacity to do something, to produce an effect, is doing everything that it presently can. Such power is always doing. It cannot be contained and it cannot be possessed. It cannot be stored up for later. Any appearance of a power being stored up is actually a power presently doing all that it can. For instance, a battery is not a portable potential, waiting for us to turn it on by placing it in a suitable circuit. It is always striving to let out, to let itself out, and it only fails to do so because it is presently overcome by a counter power. This is why, quote, it is absurd to ask strength not to express itself. So if there is no will and no power, then what is willing? Many times Nietzsche suggests that human beings are willing something. And many times Nietzsche asks human beings to will something. For example, in the Antichrist, section three, Nietzsche raises the question of what kind of human being one ought to will as more valuable, more worthy of life, more certain of the future. With the understanding sketched above that there is no faculty of will with its own characteristic activity, then willing appears as an attempt to specify the occasion for letting out. Since all powers draw their ultimate consequences at every moment, a being is always doing something. It is itself a doing, a willing. But not all doing is satisfying. Overcoming obstacles feels different from struggling against obstacles. Some doing fails to get outside. That is, some doing feels like failing to do something. If we understand all drives as specified forms of will to power, specified in such a way as to have defined more narrowly 
what it is to let out. Then each drive has its own kind of outside. Thus each drive only lets out if it lets out in its way. A being is always doing something, but only some doing feels like doing. The possibility of failing to let out gives rise to the possibility of nihilism. Nietzsche says at the beginning and at the end of the third essay of On the Genealogy of Morals that the human being would rather will the nothing than not will. That means that if we become convinced that there is nothing worth doing, as otherworldliness, for instance, is bound to convince us, then we will be, be driven to try to do the nothing. If we become convinced of the inviability of all this worldly doings, our very life urge will still try to do something, even something wholly destructive. But this means the outside has become a function of our beliefs. The nihilism that, seems, that stems sorry, from the devaluing of the doings of this world by prolonged comparison with the infinitely more valuable other world deprives all this worldly occasions for doing of the sense that they are occasions for letting out. Any doing that is not worth doing does not carry with it the satisfaction of a strength that has been let out. Now, at the end of the first main part of Beyond Good and Evil, Nietzsche proclaims that, quote, psychology is now again the path to the fundamental problems. Nietzsche indicates that all prior psychology has not reached into the, the depths and suggests that in order to do so, the science of souls must be understood, quote, as morphology and the doctrine of the development of the will to power. Thus, the story of soul or mind for Nietzsche is an evolutionary one. It is a story of descent with modification. The story starts with the simplest primary form of life and the simplest primary urge of life, letting out. The first urge of life begins at the boundary of the single-celled organism. The outside is defined simply as the boundary, the membrane of the cell. The urge to let out is satisfied by any action directed toward anything outside the membrane. The will to power, in that case, flails about. It is not passive, but it needs occasions, perhaps just bumping stimuli, to define the paths out. As life develops farther, it becomes more complicated. The will to power divides and assumes particular shapes that correspond to particular ways of letting out. These shapes become fixed in form and inheritable. <laughs> the simple becomes multi-form, whereas originally any letting out, any doing satisfied the one will to power. Now there are many wills alongside one another, each with, its, with a more narrowly defined way of letting out. These wills or undersouls or drives have encounters and relations with one another. Nietzsche proposes that we should try to understand the one soul as a social structure of drives and affects. That's in Beyond Good and Evil 12. And this might be even better stated by saying our body is but a social structure composed of many souls. That's in Beyond Good and Evil 19. Articulated and morphologic, morphologically fixed, the drives become their own separated perspectives. And on the genealogy of morals, the third essay, section 12, Nietzsche associates each affect with its own way of seeing. He suggests that we cannot escape perspective, but we will see things better, quote, the more affects we allow to speak about a, a thing, the more eyes. The drives, so stupid and troublesome in their initial forms, transform over time and circumstance. Some become more mind-like. They are intellectualized or 
spiritualized in some translations. Others are driven inward and transformed. They are sublimated. The drives are ever more individuated, just as over time living things are. Taken together, the drives can be understood as, quote, physiological demands for the preservation of a certain type of life. Within their social structure, these drives interact with one another in hierarchical relations of commanding and obeying. Quote, hence, a philosopher should claim the right to include willing as such within the sphere of morals. Morals being understood as the doctrine of the relations of supremacy under which the phenomenon of life comes to be. In understanding our experience of the world as will to power, we understand that experience as thoroughly moral. Quote, all experiences are moral experiences, even in the realm of sense perception. Not only are all drives moral in a way, all drives are also philosophic. In Beyond Good and Evil, section 9, Nietzsche tells us that, quote, philosophy is this tyrannical drive itself, the most spiritual or intellectual will to power, to the creation of the world, to the causa prima. Philosophy is not, though, I would say, one special drive. Every drive is a way of seeing the world. Every drive is a kind of letting out. And Nietzsche says of the basic drives of human beings, quote, all of them have done philosophy at some time. Every drive in principle wants to let out all it can. Philosophically, this means letting out by viewing the whole world according to their own perspective. Such a total letting out also means mastering the other drives. That the drives can have such relationships of mastery, of one over another, depends upon a complex and spacious inner realm that can come to serve as a kind of intellectual action space. Now, as sketched above, there is a story of evolutionary changes that divide the simple will to power with its simple outside into many fixed and inheritable forms, each with its own outside. This story runs through the story of organic life generally, and perhaps much of this story involves morphological developments that occurred long ago within our pre-human ancestors. However, what Nietzsche calls the development of depth is a story that belongs primarily to human history. What Nietzsche calls the slave revolt in morality was an attempt by a priestly caste to subvert and overcome psychologically their more active and warlike political opponents. This psychological warfare turned human beings against their own drives. It called upon us to suppress our own outwardness, and thus it drove us inward. What develops from this are many complications and complexes. New sicknesses and new weaknesses ensue, but also new possibilities. The priests did massive damage to human health, especially as that health was oriented around letting out. But this damage also made human beings interesting and deep. It is on the foundation of the action of the priests that, quote, man first became an interesting animal. What makes human beings interesting is that, quote, the human soul became deep in the higher sense and turned evil for the first time. This depth of the human being is the product of the vast trauma produced by the continued action of drives suppressed and denied their outward expression. Quote, all instincts that are not unloaded to the outside, nach außen entladen, turn inside. This is what I call the internalization of the human being. With it, there now evolves in the human being what will later be called his soul. The whole inner world, originally stretched thinly as though between two layers of skin, was expanded 
and extended itself and gained depth, breadth, and height in proportion to the degree that the unloading to the outside of the human being was hemmed in. All those instincts of the wild, free, roving human being were turned backwards against the human being himself. This last, by the way, is a description of the effect of the restraint of thwarting of the drives generally. But it describes well the development of a deep and interesting inner realm that results from the slave revolt in morality. Now, with all this groundwork laid down, let us look at the outside in some of the more challenging ways in which it manifests itself in Nietzsche's writing. In Beyond Good and Evil, section 230, Nietzsche begins by describing what he calls the basic will of the spirit, or the basic will of the mind, as something that tries to take in the world and thus to master the world in limited and measured ways. Two modes are described. The first is, is to simplify the manifold of the new, as yet unmastered experiences, by falsifying them enough to fit them into existing familiar categories. Quote, its intent in all this is to incorporate new experiences, to file new things in old files, growth in a word, or more precisely, the feeling of growth, the feeling of increased power. Thus, taking in intellectually is a way of letting out. This taking in tries to avoid the disturbance of facing directly or fully what is new. And the new is disturbing. We might even say painful. As Nietzsche says it, what is new is always evil. The other mode of the basic will of the spirit is a kind of limiting of the horizon while still trying to appropriate and master what does not yet belong to that limited horizon. Nietzsche describes this as, quote, a shutting of one's windows, a refusal to let things approach, a kind of state of defense against much that is knowable, a satisfaction with the dark. This kind of limiting of the horizon only allows the new to be encountered in a measured pace, or at a measured pace, measured in proportion to the mind's power to appropriate something Nietzsche compares to a digestive capacity. Thus, Nietzsche describes the mind's measured and cautious approach to being master in and around its own house. But Nietzsche goes on to describe a counter will to the basic will of the spirit that throws aside measure and caution and tries to force the self to take in the new fully in all of its painfully disturbing newness. This counter will is, quote, that sublime inclination of the seeker after knowledge who insists on depth, multiplicity, and thoroughness with a will which is a kind of cruelty of the intellectual conscience and taste. The cruelty of this cruel will is self-directed, or rather directed at the other parts of the self. What we should see here is a drive that has found in the depth of our inner world a way to let itself out. It has found an outside within us. This drive, though remaining within us, does not apparently suffer the frustration of feeling that it has failed to get outside. Nietzsche offers this cruel will as an answer to the question, why have knowledge at all? Further, Nietzsche presents this cruel will that serves as an intellectual conscience as something that drives its possessors to recognize once again, quote, the terrible basic text of homo natura. The discovery of such a new outside within the deep and interesting realm of our inner experience is remarkable, but in a way, perhaps only by means of analogy, it can be thought of like the action space of the external world. Entities inhabiting this inner world can serve as occasions and obstacles upon which 
Other such entities can let themselves out. Psychic action can stay within the psyche. But there are other aspects of our complicated psyche that further complicate the will to power and its outside. At the beginning of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, the title character has gathered a certain fullness of wisdom and feels the pressure of that fullness needing to let out. Zarathustra thinks of that wisdom as a gift, and he intends to give that gift to humankind. What is required for Zarathustra to feel that his gift of wisdom has been let out? For one, it requires other humans, that is, beings capable of receiving wisdom. It also requires beings for whom such wisdom would be a gift. Zarathustra does not give his wisdom to the first human being he meets, an old gray holy man. This is because that holy hermit has not heard that God is dead. Thus, Zarathustra's gift-giving, one might say the wisdom of his wisdom, is predicated on the death of God. The death of God does not just mean human beings have ceased to believe in a deity, as our previous conference sometimes suggested. The death of God means the source of the value of things is gone. This is perfectly sim symbolized when Zarathustra says in his first speech about the Superman, once the sin against God was the greatest sin, but God died, and these sinners died with him. To sin against the earth is now the most dreadful thing. Sin is entirely defined by its relation to God. Now a new determining source of the value of things is needed. Human beings themselves, as earthly, this-worldly beings, must be the new source of value. Zarathustra's wisdom is supposed to help human beings to grow into becoming such a source. In the very first town he finds, Zarathustra tries to give a crowd gathered in the marketplace for quite different purposes, his gift of wisdom. He must assume that the crowd is prepared in the right way to receive his gift. He assumes that because these people live in a town, they are engaged with one another in speech, in logos. This is unlike the old gray hermit who lives among the animals and who has abandoned human speech for animal sounds. Zarathustra expects that the use of logos of reason will necessarily lead to the death of God. That, it, that is Nietzsche's madman when he proclaims it in the Gay Science 125 says, we have killed him. Thus, Zarathustra presumes that the, that the townsfolk are proper recipients of, of his wisdom. And thus he expects that they will let him let his wisdom out. Now, Zarathustra gives three speeches, each in its own way about the Superman, and each in its way, I think, is interrupted, so we never see them completed. All of the speeches fail to have their intended effect, and consequently, Zarathustra feels that he has failed to let out. Zarathustra looks at his audience and sees that they have not been moved in the way that he wished them to be moved. He says to his heart, they do not understand me. I am not the mouth for these ears. So Zarathustra tries to let out a teaching, and it fails. That is because the letting out of a teaching requires some level of understanding by another human being or other human beings. A teaching is not out unless it is understood. Why is it not enough just to utter the thought in, in speech? Why is it not enough to think the thought to yourself? Although the will to power is an internal impulse that does not require external stimuli to get it started, 
The will to power leads to many developments that require specialized and perhaps rare external occasions in order for it to have a satisfactory expression. Perhaps the most challenging example of this can be found in the lonely and beautiful episode of Thus Spoke Zarathustra called The Night Song. I will not go into the many interesting details of that episode here. I will just focus on the way Zarathustra expresses the grave difficulty of the giver of gifts out of fullness. He presents such a gift giver as a light-giving body at night. Such a giver is beset with the problem that, quote, I live in my own light. I drink back into myself the flames that break out of me. I do not know the happiness of those who receive. The gift giver that lets out his own fullness wants to turn others into full beings, into independent sources of their own goodness. But this would be to make them into light givers themselves. The sight of the needy with their hands outstretched tires the gift giver. Their need is not nice to look at. It is not enlivening. But is the sight of other gift givers desirable as that is, available to one who is letting, who is themselves a gift giver? Zarathustra says, quote, many suns revolve in the void. To all that is dark, they speak with their light. To me, they are silent. Oh, this is the enmity of the light against what shines. Now, what is going on here is, of course, subject to many possible interpretations. What I will suggest is that Zarathustra is confronting the challenge of giving a certain kind of intellectual gift. It is perhaps the fundamental challenge of the highest aspirations of teaching. Zarathustra's gift is meant to give a certain kind of independence. How does one teach a student to be independent? The giving of the giver threatens to get in the way of the independence sought. At the end of part one of Thus Spoke Zarathustra, Zarathustra tells those who are following him to, quote, lose me and find yourselves. Is that not what one must do for those one wishes to make independent, to let them go? But what then becomes of one's own urge to let out one's wisdom of independence. Does the complication of the human animal, the human mind, finally arrive at a kind of strength, a kind of fullness that cannot be let out, because there is no proper outside for such strength? Is this nonsense, or is it a merit of the teaching of the will to power that leads us to such thoughts? Thank you. Thank you for your talk. I just, I wondered what thoughts you had about the relation between um, aphorism 36 uh, in Beyond Good and Evil, or, which you talked at length about him setting forth the hypothesis about will to power, and aphorism 37, where yeah. he talks, he seems to talk, he seems to suggest, although maybe this is incorrect, that, that uh, the will to power uh, hypothesis fails or to refute God and perhaps even has the opposite effect. Yes, right. So, I mean, I think I think something very clear about this, which might not, might mean there's something wrong with my understanding. Uh, people think that will, maybe especially if you say the word willfulness, is the principle of wickedness and the principle of the devil. Uh, Look at Willkür and Kant if you want to see, right? But, but all over, I think, so 
I think Nietzsche is trying to say that his doctrine of will is actually not the, the di diabolic principle. It's the principle of a god, of, of a being that uh, what do I say, is its own source of the authority and value of what it does. And so the, maybe the, the clearest thing one could say about what a god is, is what's indicated in the middle of Beyond Good and Evil in 150. It's not, in one way it's actually the middle, in another way it's not actually the middle. But there Nietzsche asks what does everything turn into around three different kinds of beings, a, a hero, a, a semi-god, and a god. And the suggestion of what everything turns around, into around a god is a world. It's also, there's a, I would say, a subliminal suggestion that that should be a comedy. Because he says around the hero, it turns into a tragedy. Around the, sem the semi-god, a satyr play. And then he says around a god, what? And then you get the dash, which almost always in Nietzsche is meant to mean you're supposed to think it's, think some things and fill in an answer yourself. And then he's going to trick you <laughs> or give you a surprise. So you should be saying comedy, and he says world. A god is a being that makes a world. And I think Nietzsche associates that with the principle of will, not with the principle, for instance, of um, following the law. Thank you, Michael. That was that was really wonderful, and I'm just so grateful for your help in making sense of this obviously important term, will to power. Um, I wonder if you could say a little bit more about the difference between strength and force, because as I read it, it's it's on, it's the letting out of force of kraft, mm -hmm. which isn't and he has a different word for strength. Sure, so, sure. And when you think of force, you think wrongly, no doubt, something that you, there's a limited quantity of, and once you've let it out, there's none, no more. <laughs> so could you just say something in your, in your understanding, what the difference is between strength and force, or whether the verbal difference is, is a significant one? Yeah. Kraftig and, and, um, and Starke are diff, you know, different words. Oh, yeah, yeah. but I, I probably, in the will to power term itself, you should see another term that would have to be sorted or mingled with them, which is macht, right? right? And um, so might, one might say. Yeah. I, I think there's other words that Nietzsche uses about force, if you're thinking particularly about violent force, like gewalt. What, one of the things he says about uh, that kind of violent force is um, you shouldn't use it on the truth. This is the one other place where he, he echoes the supposition of the preface, supposing truth is a woman. It's the one, uh, one other time he, he says truth is a woman in Beyond Good and Evil, he says you shouldn't use force on it. But I, I think there's lots of things in Nietzsche's notebooks where he's, that might be helpful. I, I wouldn't go to the so-called will to power, because I think it's been shown to have been meddled with too, too much. Fully a third, I think, of the passages have been adulterated in one way or another. But some of the notes that belong to that grouping just try to say what, try to make comparisons between his thought about will and something like Newtonian force. And there, I think, he's, he's really trying to indicate a, you can't have um, a Newtonian mechanistic account for a world that where things think. Right? So that will is understood to be the replacement for the notion of, I think, New New Newtonian force. That's what I probably... I, mean, I, I agree with what you're saying about Kraft and Starke, but... I'm not sure whether um, there's a consistent distinction being made between those two. Yeah. Thanks for the talk, Michael. Uh, 
I had a question I th think that was triggered by talk about self-preservation earlier. I mean, mm. one of the things, things Nietzsche is up to with the uh, with his discussion of the world of power is, of course, engaging with the life sciences of his day, and he's engaged in particular with Darwin. And so Darwin provides a kind of alternative, you know, model of thinking about, um, you know, human agency in a sort of, you know, a, a world without God, as it were. And Nietzsche critiques that that kind of vision. That's a vision that's not teleological, right? It's just sort of, sort mm -hmm. of random mutations that characterize the development of, of new organisms. So Nietzsche is providing a, a, a different a different alternative. I, I mean, maybe you could speak to the sort of teleology question on, on Nietzsche's side, because at the beginning of your talk, I, I think I heard you say that you know, you know, Nietzsche is kind of anti-teleological with regard to the with, with, with the will to power, but you know, there's a kind of teleology that comes out here at the end with it. It's pointed towards a kind of philosophical life as the as the pinnacle of it. Sure, I I agree. There's a lot that points to the philosophic life as a pinnacle, um, but maybe not as a permanent pinnacle. Uh, and that might mean that it's just the the latest iteration of something that's driven from behind rather than aiming at something. But I. I there's lots to say, I think, about Nietzsche's engagement with Darwin. And in a way, I think Darwin, Darwin appears to Nietzsche as a, a minor figure in the, within the realm of the thinkers of development. You know, he lumps them together with Hegel, for instance, who he thinks is a, not a philosopher, but a, a great genius and uh, much more impressive. But I, I think from Darwin, you should probably look to Lamarck that is the big difference, I think, between Darwin and Lamarck is that the modification the, uh, on the basis of which, inheritable modification on the basis of which evolutionary stories are told, which I think Nietzsche relies on or, or thinks that they're in some way true, correct, it comes from more than one source for Lamarck. And, I, and if you read Darwin, I think he has many editions of the origin of species, and he makes many changes. So I don't know what it means to read one, but I've studied a few of them. And Darwin also admits that Lamarck might have something correct. But what is essential for Nietzsche about Lamarck, I think, is that there's a principle within that constitutes the basic principle of life and that will change things regardless of their circumstances or their environment. So, and so Lamarck has, expresses it, I think, as irritability is the the, pr the principle that belongs to and characterizes living things, that they are ready for action. <laughs> and I think in that, in that thing that Lamarck offers, Nietzsche sees something like the will to power. That is, he sees something that would produce action even if there were no need or deficit, even if there were no external pressure. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question uh, about the last bit of your talk on Zarathustra as teacher, um, mm -hmm. um, and and your account of teaching as a form of of letting out or gift giving. Um, it seems to me that there are two ways one could plausibly understand the act of teaching as letting out or gift giving. Um, one way. One option would be uh, you could understand it on the model of a, of a child who just wants to set the world in motion. Um, you know, the child might make a mess or, or might clean up a mess, though that seems unlikely. Um, uh, either way, either it's way. the little concern to the child who just wants to do something to the world. Um, that seems to be option one. Option two uh, would, would be to understand Zarathustra's act of teaching on the model of a, of a of, of a generous man inspired by a notion of justice who wants to um, improve the world by bringing light to people's minds. And so my, I guess I have two questions. My first is, which of those two is it? And if it's the second, which it seems to me to be more plausibly, um, partly because Nietzsche seems to want to um, uh, shape the world in a very specific way 
he laments the way it's been shaped thus far, especially by Christianity. Uh, I think in Beyond Good and Evil 63, um, he speaks of the, the pity and disgust he feels um, when beholding the world shaped by Christianity and, and how an Maybe Epicurean 62. God. Maybe 62. It's 62. Yeah, 63 Sorry. is about well, teaching, actually. Uh, 62. Um, you've taught me something. Uh, new. Um, Just one thing. Uh, and, and so I'm inclined to the second of those two options. And then yeah. so my, my second question is, um, if that's the case, and I don't know if you'd agree it is, but if that's the case, how important is it to Nietzsche to... Um, to shape the world in a way that's not just, in his opinion, um, uh, better, but in fact and truly. OK. So I'll, I'll try to talk about the first one first. And I, you know, the, you may have noticed in this talk I'm really trying to play out the suggestion that, that Nietzsche offers as the hypothetical experiment we should make. And so if you play that out, you don't give that second account you give, at least not the way you did. And I think this, the, the text is mostly against you in this regard. But it is undoubtedly the case that human beings come to have uh, desires to do justice, for instance, and very powerful. Part of our life, I think, is the desire to do justice. Uh, in Nietzsche, I think it flares up much more in terms of intellectual justice than, although he does talk about social justice with, I think, great fervor, like not treating unequals as if they were equal. But I would say Nietzsche is interested in changing the world. But he's not, in, not interested in one particular kind of change. He really is genuinely experimental. Uh, maybe because of commitments to a certain kind of moral stance that believes that anything that lasts for a long time ceases to be so very useful to human beings. I wouldn't say, he, by the way, he is ungrateful to Christianity for what it's done. And I, I mentioned the slave revolt. Our entire inner life, in a certain way, in the highest sense, is greatly affected by the, the mingling of all the various transformations of drives that were forced to be suppressed and all the ways in which we've conflicted with ourselves, but also all the ways in which human beings have fought against the demands of Christianity and developed aspects of themselves in that fight. So. I would say he's, uh, I would say, he doesn't want anything to continue to exist forever. And yet, I think he doesn't want to lose any of the benefits of anything that has come into existence. He's essentially, how would I say, a recycler. <laughs> if it exists now, turn it into something else. And if it has come into existence, make as good a use of it as is possible. So and I, I think this is part of you know, the, the eternal return teaching, which I didn't talk about at all. It's part of his affirmation. It's part of what he means by loving fate. And there's, I think, a passage in, in Human All to Human, which maybe is, in a way, most emblematic. He, he's, it's called The Fertile Field. But it's a dream of Nietzsche that anything that falls upon his soil would, be, would, would grow as a consequence. He dreams of being so rich that he can make something living and good out of anything that happens to fall to him. So happenstance or chance and its role in life is, would be turned into uh, something that would be desirable and affirmable. So that's the first part. <laughs> is that enough? I mean, I, I, I think maybe one more thing. The attempt to understand everything in terms of will to power, at some point, like any monism, can blur every, every distinction. And it's maybe helpful to our understanding to always find underneath everything something that traces back to this primitive urge to let out. 
But it's like the, the causes that are described at the end of Plato's Timaeus. There are the, the little particles all beautifully geometrically described that are the primary causes of the world. And then there are the ways in which they combine together that constitute the development of what, he, what Plato or Plato Socrates calls secondary causes. The secondary causes are what kills us when we get sick. It's when our, our complicated structures, like our organs, start to fail. The primary causes are what makes everything perish, ultimately. That is, the, li the little parts, even those that constitute the organic uh, formations, they, they fall apart as well. So if we didn't die from secondary causes, which is mainly how we die, mainly how we live, is on the basis of the secondary causes, the primary causes would assert themselves. I think if you press the idea of thinking of everything as will to power, then justice, too, becomes one of the forms of will to power. And it's a powerful secondary cause, which in many respects is going to be a more important rubric for understanding behavior. But underneath it, one can understand justice itself as some kind of transformation of that original urge. Now, you're, now I've got to get to your second question, because you restated slightly. You're just, if, um... If it's the case, sorry. If it's the case that um, Nietzsche is animated by a, a moral motive, mm -hmm. um, which I certainly agree is complicated by the fact that he's a monist, um, and uh, you know the account that he would give of you is is fundamentally the same account he would give of the podium. Um, uh, yeah. But but if he is animated by a moral motive. How important is it to him that that morality that's animating him be the true one? You know, so I think at the end of section 22, he, when he's been talking about this kind of rough understanding of the, the tyrannical or more than tyrannical character of the natural world where every power draws its consequences at all times, he, he just says, suppose someone should say this is just an interpretation. And his answer is, umso besser. All the better. I think he, gives, he wants to give credit to the person who says that for having insight. And if it's really treated as insight, it would be an acceptance that we can't do any better. Now, there's a kind of argument that Nietzsche is making, even in section 36, for the superiority of the will to power understanding to other kinds. Uh, this is partially, I mentioned, the mind-body mind dualism is one of the things that uh, the monist transcends, but also maybe an answer to the, the po possibility of, of impossible things happening. If all things are related, in, in terms of degree and not, and not different in kind, then miracles, for instance, can't happen. That means no revelation. That means a lot of things. But I, I think what I said in answer to your first question probably is the answer to your second question. That is, this, at some point in time, maybe by the time there are humans at all, if, you know, if one doesn't follow Darwin and Lamarck and realize there are no species, for instance, or no cardinal differences between the species. Because, for instance, you are the living descendant of something that wasn't human, right? So is it gone and extinct? Are you a new species? Hmm? Hey. The real answer, though, is that by the time we have beings as complicated as human beings, the, the will to power is divided and complicated, and it's been fixed. This is what the morphological development idea really means, is that new modes, a, a thing that's just trying to get out, gets into circumstances that limit the way it gets out. And that gets fixed. So it's maybe not permanent, but it's for a long time. And it's what we inherit and where we start. But those fixtures of the will to power, the specifications of the ways in which it wants to let out mean that certain drives want to do one thing only, like justice. And they don't want to do other things. They don't want to compromise with other drives. 
And so the very notion of letting out for them is framed by that one morphological outlet that it has been fixed in. So the secondary causes become the important ways to understand the life experiences of the beings that themselves are inheritors of a certain kind of fixity. Now, on the other hand, you know, I mentioned your pre-human ancestors. I hope that's not casting an aspersion on you. One of the funnier things I think I, I've ever encountered in Nietzsche was a thought he has about our, our vegetable ancestors. Right? He's, he just says in passing, maybe this is the source of the thought that Parmenides has, that all is one, is that it's a remnant of our, our plant ancestry, for, for whom, you know, without motility and, and sensation, as Aristotle would describe them, all is one. So that you, there might be lines to in which one might see certain thoughts and certain ways of seeing aspects of the world belong specifically to each of these different morphological developments. Now, maybe uh, about what Jeff Church said about the height of philosophy could also be something could be said about that. I mean, I mentioned the one part, just one part. Well, I mentioned philosophy a couple different times. When Nietzsche says every, every drive has at times done philosophy, there are parts where he points out, you know, it's not wonder sometimes. Sometimes it's anger or terror that really is the, the urge that's trying to frame a vision of the world around itself and that's trying to master all the other competing visions of the other drives. So that might be one way to think about philosophy as a, you know, a tyrannical, world-creating drive, a drive that seeks to make, a, make itself a god. But the other thing I mentioned is this cruel will, the very intellectual conscience that tries to make you say, no, let's see what it, the thing is as it's available to us. But I don't think that availability for Nietzsche ever escapes the thought that we see the world from inside and not from outside, and that in that respect, we don't have pristine objectivity. I have a question about um, Nietzsche's corpus. You, you pinned a lot of your argument on um, uh, Beyond Good and Evil and Zarathustra, and I, 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 that makes sense to me. Um, me and Jeff Church are probably the only people in the room who've read the uh, early works, <laughs> or, or uh, yourself included. And I'm just curious, um, I, I have this sense, uh, having studied with you and these sorts of things that, um, in talking with you, that you see Nietzsche as a thinker whose thoughts aren't as separate as the early, middle, and late period distinctions would give us to believe, that uh, Nietzsche's one mind, and that mind uh, consists of um, thoughts which are in pre-form in the early writings, which come out in a different form in the late writings. I think you can see this with The Last Man, you can see this with uh, The New Philosopher, and many of the other sort of major concepts in his writing. So I'm curious if you can identify any place prior to Zarathustra where the genesis of this notion of letting out occurs. Do you see it in Human All Too Human? Do you see it in, in The Untimelies? Do you see it in Dawn? Um, is there, you know, where does this come from? Because I can trace a lot in Nietzsche back to the birth of tragedy and the untimelies, but this one, I'm grasping at straws to find it. So when does this occur, or begin to occur? Well, I think maybe the first appearances in, of will to power itself might be in Zarathustra, the few places where it's explicitly mentioned. But it's also showing up, I think, in the first edition of the gay science before his, his post Zarathustran editions. I mean, in a, in a, now, on the other hand, uh, let's say, maybe the birth of tragedy <laughs> is the, you have to go and look and see what the Dionysian urge itself is. It's, it shows itself there more, I think, as immersion in a union with the, the whole totality of the world. You know, one of the things that Nietzsche says about tragedy is that all tragedies are about, are about Dionysus. And I think the image of Dionysus, not so much in distinction from Apollo as it is in, in the birth of tragedy, 
the later images of, about Dionysus are all, all about, I think, the, the idea of letting out. And so I, 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 I would acknowledge this, I think, to anyone who, who makes the tripartite distinction of Nietzsche's thought that it exists. I acknowledge it because Nietzsche himself judges that. Although I think when he was seven, he also divided his works into three parts, <laughs> and then he destroyed a bunch of them, <laughs> including little plays about a little porcelain squirrel. Um, so, you know, Nietzsche is, I think, often reflecting on his prior works, and, and probably the most important thing to say about the division, the, the schema, is after Zarathustra is published and Nietzsche's collecting up the publishing rights to all his books, he writes you know, new prefaces to everything. Well, not, not to the untimelies, but to everything else. And those new prefaces often seem to me, there's, there's something that actually in his correspondence with Georg Brandis, he recommends reading those prefaces before reading anything else as, as being a way in to Nietzsche's thought. They, they offer, to my mind, if you read them, especially the self-criticism of the birth of tragedy, but also the others, including two prefaces to Human All to Human. They offer new reading instructions. And they perform, in 1886, something like what Nietzsche performs again in 1888 with Eke Homo. He, he looks at his whole work. He says, this is all me, as incredible as it might seem, which he does indicate the works seem so very different that you might not believe that they have the same source and author. But he does tie them all together. And, he, and he, in two epochs, I'd say, in the these prefaces that he adds and the other additions. And in Eke Homo, he tells you how to read it. And you, know, you can see that these are new things. You know, Substitute my name for Schopenhauer's name, things like that. That's a big change in a small compass. So I would say not that there's a simple consistency to Nietzsche's thought. He's always reworking his own works. If, again, if you go to the notebooks, He's meddling with things he's already published and considering or developing a, a pathway to a new publication of the same things refigured. And I think he, he's, this is what I said to Dustin as well, Nietzsche's interested in always growing forth from whatever position and achievement he's actually accomplished. So that though I think people might very well attribute some run amok vanity to things he says in Ecce Homo, you know, why I write such good books. But that's not even the most extreme one, right? Nietzsche's not satisfied with that. He's not just thumping his chest and saying, look what I did. Even, even when he's saying things like, I've given humanity the greatest gift that's ever been given to it, right? Or I've written the book that is most perfect in terms of style and content. Right? And other things that he says about Zarathustra, then he wants to go beyond that. Uh, and I think that's, you know, this, that's emblematic of his understanding of this life urge. I didn't talk about it tonight, but how letting out itself, which I think is just expending the resources, I think Susan mentioned they're gone once you've expended. That's what peace is for, by the way, in Nietzsche's mind, is to restore capacities. That's what sleep is for. None, not, not as ends, but as means to living forth more. You have, and so he has these thoughts of ebb and flow, that you have to actually have different epochs in your own life and activity, periods of so-called inactivity, periods of building up, maybe even, by the way, periods of oppression, periods where you, instead of command, you obey. All of those are for the sake of letting out, I think. Do you have something else in mind where it might begin? I mean, the only other thing I can think of would be in the Wagner essay. And um, mm. you know mm. what I mean mm -hmm. when, he, when he talks about Wagner needing to let out, and mm -hmm. Schopenhauer, too, uh, yeah. in a way. So I wonder if it's not present all the way back in the typologies and psychologies of such men as they are. Yeah, so I, I think the, the history essay, uh, 
has at least this sense. I, 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 we may have a dispute about this, I don't know. I take the three kinds of history that Nietzsche sketches in the untimely meditation on, on history, all to be for the sake of one kind of history, what he calls monumental history. Everything else is secondary. I agree. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, that's better for us, though maybe we won't grow as much. <laughs> Hi. Uh, uh, thanks, for, thanks for the talk. I wanted to ask about, um, you mentioned the notion of taking in as a way of letting out. And, yeah. and I, I wanted to ask generally whether you consider Auslausen characteristic of the will to power or whether there's also this taking in movement. And you just said a second ago that it's still for the sake of letting out. Yeah. Um, but I'm thinking now of Gay Science 370, where he d divides between fullness and hunger. As, mm -hmm. a, as a replacement of the division between being and becoming, and creates that fourfold typology. Would hunger be still be a form of Auslausen? And if not, then is it still a form of the will to power? Yeah, so this is a complication that I didn't um, try to address tonight, but it's, I think, Nietzsche, of course, if he's trying to explain the whole world in terms of will to power, he faces all sorts of difficulties and complications on how to, how to conceive of certain kinds of things as will to power. Um, and one of the big challenges, I think, is to see how accumulating capacities, growing, how growing and becoming more powerful is compatible with the thought of spending power or expending power. There, I think, the complicated story generally becomes something like the, the seeking of, ever, of greater capacities, the attempt to raise oneself into conditions that allow oneself to let out more would encompass, I think, the, something like hunger. It's the period in which one is building up or restoring what you've let out. In a certain way, um, I think Nietzsche does understand the natural world as um, squandering its resources again and again, and, the, and that that's very much the way things go. But there's a certain kind of foresight and intelligence that comes into being one might understand that even as a, a very complicated complex of more primitive ways of thinking that come to, together and that can calculate, you know, if I don't do this now, I can do that later. And I think that kind of delayed understanding is, is the basis of thought itself in a way. It, it's connected, for instance, if you know the, uh, the work of Hans Jonas and the phenomenon of life, it's connected just to our senses and our spatial distances, that we can become aware of things that can be objects of desire. And by, by desire here, I might mean objects that would let us have the occasion for expenditure, but that they are in the distance. And so they can't be immediately um, part of our action, part of our doing. But they require then the development of mind and desire itself has that kind of structure of delay and distance mm -hmm. that belongs maybe just to our being s sensing beings that then have as a consequence space. And I think in the Heideggerian kind of terminology that inspires Hans Jonas, then we become beings with a world. May I follow up? Yeah. Um, um, that, that seems to be plausible in, in regard to um, Beyond Good and Evil 230, where it's a temporary condition. Where you're talking about somebody, somebody like uh, Wagner, romanticism, the way that Nietzsche understands it by 1886 yeah. or 1887, there doesn't seem to be a moment when Wagner is going to uh, recover. Is this is the, the cure for Wagner himself? Uh, yeah. Or, not, not all of these moments seem to be prudential in that regard, that there seem to be well, types right. of life that are on, you know, declining or degenerating or something, like decadent or something like that. Sure. That can't be covered sure. in the same way. But in those modes, I think one would maybe I think declining modes, you know, which Nietzsche pays a lot of attention to. And it's not just someone like Wagner that maybe uh, this audience maybe doesn't have a great esteem for. He says it about Plato and Socrates, that he s s 
smells decay in them. And I think he suggests in the beginning of the problem of Socrates in Twilight that the, the decadence, the decaying character might be ubiquitous among, among the wise. Right? He coins a counter Hegelian phrase. It's not that the owl of Minerva takes flight at, at dusk, right, when wisdom is coming into being. And, and the history is ending. He says, maybe wisdom is like a raven that takes flight when it gets a smell of carrion, right? That the thing about decadence, I think, is in, in the way Nietzsche often sketches is, is that there, the outlets for letting out of, of the resources, one might say, of decaying beings that are, are going down, they become often more self-destructive and limited. So you know, the people who are dissatisfied with themselves might turn to ways of actually harming themselves. But this is a way to feel powerful. You could see this with the ubiquity of tattoos these days, especially since many of them are not very nice looking. People who put them on themselves feel powerful. They can do something to themselves. And it doesn't have to be positive, right? You still feel like, especially if your positive urges are thwarted because of your decay, then you still feel the, the satisfaction of letting out on yourselves to make yourself worse than you are. You still come to some kind of mastery. This is one of the things that Nietzsche says about Napoleon. Right? He never was able to speak French well enough to satisfy himself. But as emperor, he's the model of the whole empire. And he deliberately chose, because of his own frustration with his French abilities, he chose to speak less well than he could to corrupt all of the, you know, all of the citizens, all of his subjects. But that's a way to feel powerful that you probably wouldn't pursue if you thought there was a positive or ascending mode that you could actually let yourself out into. And you know, this is one of the things Nietzsche says, I think, about people who have um, very unsatisfactory lives. They live on the hope that they, that they can push down someone who's lower than them. Right? Or they go home and kick their dog. Because that, again, is a way to let out. Not, not a very satisfying way. And I, I, I think the more drives we have, the, the less satisfied they'd be, they would be generally with that mode of expression. But something is satisfied. This is work. Okay. Um, I have a very simple question, but it's <laughs> bothered me for a long time. And that is, it, you have provoked me to ask it because you've put so much emphasis on the will to power. And yet the, the claim that Nietzsche indubitably makes that everything is will to power seems to be homogenizing. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing that he seems to oppose more than homogenization or equalization. And I guess it becomes difficult for me, even with quantitative differences, to mm. say how you get ranking, for example, out of everything being will to power. Well, I, I agree that quantitative differences, which he sometimes simply points to, they wouldn't be a very satisfying way to establish a, a hierarchy. The, I think the hierarchy that he does aim at is more the difference between, and this he really points to explicitly in Twilight, and both explicitly and also implicitly in what he says about Goethe in, in Twilight. He makes a distinction between ascending life and descending life. So the, the, the will to power of a certain human type might be expressed in the same way, but it has a different meaning for him if it's expressed by a human being who's on the way up as opposed to a human being that's on the way down. So I think the difference between ascending and descending life is probably the, the place where he most tries to hang his peg about how one ranks things. On the other hand, sometimes he just treats rank as a matter of taste. And, and I don't mean the 
the relativistic way in which people use the word taste. I mean the way people used to use the word taste. Either you have it or you don't. So there's, there's lots of places where Nietzsche points to what <laughs> distinguishes one human being from, from another. And they're not all expected places, I think. So there's just what people think of it means to possess something. That's a, a differentiator. Yeah. Um, but I just want to come back with that because he also talks about human beings as the only unfinished animals. Yeah. And so human beings are different, but then that means there's some distinction between will to power as it manifests itself in human beings sure. and will to power in the rest of the world, even though you said that, to my surprise, I have to say that batteries have will to power, they just don't have the right circumstances. Yeah, we put walls around them. Um, <laughs> that prevent them from discharging. You, I, I study and teach electricity sometimes and magnetism. But uh, I, I think I want to just s say this about the, the notion of sort of intrinsic potential, <laughs> maybe. Right? The, that might be, in a way, something that confuses us. I'll go back maybe, though, to my distinction between the primary causes and the secondary causes. I, I think Nietzsche, when he does all his fine psychological work, he's not generally reducing everything to the same thing, right? On the other hand, it's very helpful to some of that fine psychological work to see that underlying many seemingly disparate human behaviors, there's the same thing. Like I think in near the very beginning of the gay science, uh, Nietzsche talks about the feeling of power. And he talks about people who do harm and people who do good <laughs> or uh, well. <laughs> to. And there he says it's the same underlying urge. But then you get, I think, an elaboration of why one would choose one mode or the other, why hurt somebody or help somebody. Nietzsche actually, I think, indicates there that the people who choose to hurt are the impatient because they want to see the they want to see the reaction they want to see the acknowledgement in their victim right away and get the immediate gratification and so there's a, some distinction there but it's not a not as if this person is gratifying a fundamentally different urge than that person so the benevolent and the the cruel have a common underside, I want to say. That's enlightening, too. I mean, so I, I don't think Nietzsche wants to sacrifice that to a more simplistic source for a standard of ranking. Oh, this, uh, what I had in mind was you also alluded to the passage um, in the first uh, part of Beyond Good and Evil when he says that all human beings have been lying from the time we chose to generalize. So sure, that points sure. towards a very, I mean, everything in the world is, what should I say, fundamentally different, particular. Yeah, so, I mean, what would you say? Nietzsche points to uh, lies or untruth as a condition of life, right, at, at the beginning of Beyond Good and Evil. And, but there he means things like the thought that there are things the thought that there are identical things. These synthetic judgments a priori, the very basic synthetic judgments a priori of Kant. Nietzsche says those are lies. We don't, meaning I think they don't, we do not have a sufficient ground for the claims that they make. On the other hand, he also says we need them. In fact, the whole first main part of Beyond Good and Evil on the prejudices of the philosophers is not a, a a critique that says we can do without prejudice, but that we must, uh, to live, make judgments before we have uh, fully sufficient grounds for those judgments. Not always, but in many decisive and important senses that allow us to have uh, a practical realm in which we can treat things like breakfast as the solution to hunger every, every morning. <laughs> right? Well, that's homogenizing, too. 
but maybe not simply true. Okay, well, uh, please join me in thanking uh, Dr. Granke for a wonderful talk. You elevated me. Doctor. I'm a doctor now. Uh, and thank you all for joining us, and I now invite you to